I think we're live, right? We're broadcast is live. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the Open Business Council Summit uh, and a special panel that we have focused on smart cities and the circular economy. My name is Jeremy Lussman. Uh, I'm a partner with the global law firm of DLA Piper, and I head up our Israel practice group. I'm based in Tel Aviv, originally from the U.S. Uh, I moved to Tel Aviv about 12 years ago to start our practice, uh, which is very heavily focused on the technology sector here. And we've had a great privilege over the last number of years of being very entrenched in the world of smart cities uh, and various technologies that emanate from this geography. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here with you all today. And I want to thank my good friend, Peter Chun. Uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to this forum and, and welcoming me and, and, and really giving me the opportunity uh, to interact with some wonderful uh, and esteemed professionals. I wanted to just, uh, I think we've had some last minute changes to our panel. I wanted to introduce uh, our panel. Uh, uh, we have Professor Joao Amato Neto, uh, who's a PhD and specialist of sustainability and circular economy, who's based in the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, we have uh, William Wu, who's president of One Four City, who now happens to be, I believe, in Asia, but is normally based in London. And we are also uh, joined by Peter Chun himself, who is the president of the World uh, Smart Cities Forum. Uh, we never know where Peter is exactly in the world. I think now he's in New York. Uh, he travels the world, I think, more than any of us uh, on this line combined. Uh, but it's a real privilege to, to welcome um, each of the panelists. So obviously, we have a very important topic, uh, the, whole, the whole concept of smart cities, which on, on so many levels has, has, has made, has created such an impact in the world uh, in, in, with respect to sustainability, with respect to conservation. Um, and, and, and its impact is... Uh, truly um, it's, it's had such a strong impact when it comes to uh, office design, when it comes to how people are interacting in, in their own cities with their uh, utilities. It's thinking about mobility, it's thinking about uh, safe water, uh, waste preservation, uh, waste management. There, there's so many areas that, that touch upon our day-to-day -day lives that are subsumed within smart cities. And we've seen, thankfully, many, many examples of various cities around the world that have incorporated such amazing technologies that, that truly have moved the needle and have made various cities much more sustainable. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about specific examples. And there are a lot of points and questions to, to discuss, certainly, especially in the midst of the, of the year that we've all just had uh, with COVID. Some of us are coming out of COVID a little bit quicker. Some geographies are, are, are certainly very much still within it, but understanding how smart cities are working uh, in the wake of COVID and what's changed and whatnot is, is something that we'll definitely touch upon with our panelists. So the format for the next 45 minutes or so, 45, 50 minutes, is each of our three panelists has a presentation. Uh, I'm gonna turn over the mic to each of them. They'll talk for somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes, say, uh, and then uh, we'll go right to the, we'll have three presentations consecutively, and then hopefully we'll have time at the end for 10, 15 minutes uh, of, of some uh, panel discussion and Q&A and whatnot. So uh, with that, I uh, am going to turn over the mic and ask Joao uh, to, uh, to please present uh, what he has, and then we'll, we'll go from there. William will follow Joao, and Peter will uh, go last. Okay, thank you all. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to participate in this uh, Open Business Summit. Uh, it's a very pleasure to share our research, our knowledge concerning to uh, circular economy and sustainable production system. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, eco-industrial parks and sustainable local development, talking about some principles, models, and applications. Uh, this research was supported by National Council for Scientific and Technological Development in Brazil, 
Uh, I'm from University of Sao Paulo, Department of Production Engineering and Polytechnic School. And nowadays I'm the president of the board of directors of Vanzolini Foundation. Uh, that's a foundation that promotes some a connection uh, between university and the community and the society uh, and so on. I, I, I'd like to share my presentation. I have to click share, um, share screen. Let me see. Can you see my slide? Here? Not yet. Not yet. I, I don't. I don't see it. I don't know. Uh, okay. Maybe now. And now? Yes, we see it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as I said before, uh, I'm going to talk about this issue, eco-industrial parks and sustainable local development. Uh, and try to point out some principles, models, and application. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to talk about the framework that supports this, this work. Uh, as I said, I, I'm talking about uh, industrial ecology based on circular economy and sustainability principles. And you can deal with this issue in three uh, kinds of uh, uh, dimensions. The first one is in the firm level, uh, where you can deal with uh, eco design for new products, uh, also uh, deal with pollution prevention, eco efficiency, and green accounting. And the second level uh, is the second between firms. This is the exact point that I'm I'm talking about. Uh, talking about eco-industrial parks and industrial symbiosis. In fact, this is the main concept that support the study, this work. Uh, also, we can deal with product life cycles and uh, collective initiatives, collective initiatives uh, in order to promote the sustainable production system or closed loop uh, production uh, models. And also in the third level, we can deal with the circular economy and sustainability in, in the level of global or regional. Uh, talking about, for example, with material and energy flow studies and dematerialization and decarbonization. But in this study, we will uh, concentrate in, in the second level, uh, talking about industrial ecology between firms. Okay. Uh, the main concept here is industrial ecology, understood as a branch of environment science that analyzes the industrial system in an integrated way. That's it, considering its involvement with uh, surrounding biophysical environment, as well as the ecosystem in which it is inserted. It falls within the context of circular economy and sustainable development policies. Uh, again, the concept of industrial symbiosis uh, could be understood as association or connection of companies' process in which a way that the residues of one, one plant, one company, uh, serve as input, uh, as a raw material for the other, in a many relationships as necessary to, so that, ideally, a closed circle is constituted without waste. The target is zero waste in this in this concept. Uh, so based on the last two concepts, we can, we can uh, uh, see the concept of eco-industrial parks. Uh, a circle uh, eco-industrial parks uh, is a community of businesses operating with each other and with local society to share resources efficiently, uh, resources uh, as information, energy, water, materials, infrastructure, and natural resources, leading to economic gains, gains in terms of quality of environment, and in terms also human resource equity, 
indigenous in and the local community. Uh, so, eco industrial parks are based on the principles of industrial ecology and industrial symbiosis, as I mentioned before, suggesting an industrial system operating similarly a natural ecological system. Uh, okay, let's continue. Uh, here we can point out some uh, main objectives of cooperations or symbiosis between local actors in, in a specific region. The objectives are recycling of materials and energy reuse, cooperation for improvement and integration of production processes, cooperation in development of sustainable products, adherence to a common social responsibility, and promoting of intercompany learning in the generation of knowledge. Um, here we can uh, analyze the industrial symbiosis in the eco industrial parks in three different stages, in three different parts. The first one, the stage of beginning, companies begin to share resources for a different purpose, uh, a planned cooperation. In the first stage, uh, sorry, in the second stage is the stage we can call discovery, when we find evidence that some networks generate positive and negative externalities. Externalities is a concept uh, very important in this discussion, discussion uh, within uh, circular economy and sustainable production system. Okay, and the last uh, stage is the stage, stage of integration. The network expansion is intentionally conducted by some institutionalized organization. So we can uh, uh, show you some uh, cases, some uh, international cases of industrial parks. We uh, map uh, 26 different eco-industrial parks in China. There are uh, eco-industrial parks uh, shared in all uh, China uh, territory. Okay, uh, if you have some time, you can discuss some case, particular cases. Uh, the, the next case, in fact, is the most famous case of uh, symbiosis, industrial symbiosis and eco-industrial parks, is the case of Kalundiburg Eco-Industrial in Denmark. Uh, these this eco-industrial parks uh, start with the uh, energy power station, is the center of this arrangement, and uh, after that, since the 1980s, uh, it was developed these eco-industrial parks uh, with buying and selling of byproducts between companies in, in energy, construction, agriculture, fudge farming, oil, pharmaceutical, and fertilizer sectors. It's a very, very complex industrial parks and uh, a very well-developed eco-industrial parks in Denmark. In fact, this uh, eco-industrial is a kind of paradigm for all, uh, all the world, all uh, experience, recent experience in this issue. Uh, the beginning, as I said before, uh, we had the installation of Dong Energy Power Station, played a key role in promoting industrial symbiosis between companies in that region, and a growing number of companies are being attracted to that region. This growth has been coordinated very well by supra business entities, uh, including the local government. Uh, we can point out two important institutions that support these uh, eco industrial parks in Kalundiburg. First one is the Environment Club, which has become an important forum for discussions between representatives of companies local public authorities, the municipality, agriculture, agriculture, and various organizations linked to environmental protection. The second important institution is Kalundiburg Symbiosis Center, uh, which has its main mission, the elaboration of projects, research projects for the implementation of new industrial plants in these eco parks, based on the analysis found on scientific and technological aspects. Uh, 
Then uh, another important case is in Canada, the Bernstein Eco Park, Industrial Eco Park. Bernstein, one of Canada's largest industrial parks, uh, covers a section of 2,500 uh, hectares, more than 2,000 companies, and approximately uh, 300,000 people are located in these eco parks. The companies present in Bernstein are from different sectors, with 36 printing companies, 21 paint and link distribution companies, 19 chemical companies, 20 computer assembly and repair companies, 32 automotive repair facilities, and 70 metal processing companies. In addition to this, we can see that Bernstein also has a wide range of companies in the food services, healthcare, communications, construction, retail, and transport sectors. Uh, here, the last case is the eco parts, the Brazilian eco parts. Uh, in Benevides, Benevides is a small city located in the north of Brazil, in the Amazon region, in Pará State. Uh, aligned with the goal of attracting new investments and business to the Amazon, the Eco Park uh, in Benevides will also have space to accommodate other companies interested in making sustainable use of social biodiversity assets in an area of 172 hectares. Uh, the project, this project of Benevides Eco Industrial Parks was inspired by the concept of industrial symbiosis, again, which connects companies with complementary needs, generating synergy and greater efficiency in, you, in the use of research, water, energy, and so on. This is how the, uh, the uh, vice president of operations and logistics of Natura. This is the name of the company uh, that uh, promoted these eco industrial parks. Natura is a company that produces uh, uh, perfumes and cosmetics products. Okay, it's a very well known company in terms of uh, circular economy and sustainability here in Brazil. It's a very known company. Uh, as a conclusion, we can say that generally the real adherence of these industrial formations, uh, eco industrial parks, based on uh, symbiosis, industrial symbiosis concepts, uh, are linked to circular economy and industrial symbiosis, as I said. Uh, is it still in an embryonic, embryonic stage uh, nowadays? As for the degree of development of process integration in the research. Uh, eco industrial parks, most cases are still in the embryonic stages, is protein. Few uh, industrial parks have evolved to the intermediate stages, uh, uncovering, and only a few of them are at a higher stage of development and evolution of industrial symbiosis, when you can see embeddedness and institutionalization stages. Uh, among these cases, among these eco parks, there are the eco industrial parks of Kalanburg, as I mentioned before, the most famous and certainly the most integrated uh, eco industrial parks. But we can uh, point out also some Chinese eco parks, uh, Sozhou New District and Sozhou Industrial Parks, and also Giteng Group and Taihin. Uh, just to conclude, Kalanburg remains as a world paradigm concerning integration among industrial factors and among these industries and other organizations based on a community and local government. Okay, this is a, a short presentation. Thank you very much. This is my email and the, uh, my, the, the name of my research group, Cooperation at Works and Knowledge Management. Thank you very much for the opportunity. If you have any questions, I'm okay. Just to interrupt. Thanks, Joao. That thank was you, really. Thank you very uh, much for the, the audience. Thank you very much for this opportunity. That was fascinating. What a great okay, presentation! Have, what a great presentation! Questions. And you touched you touched upon really so many Im important uh, topics. And I'm sure I, I don't know if there is a framework. Uh, on our platform right now for lots of questions. Maybe we'll, 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 we'll monitor the chat, but if not, uh, the, the fact that you were able to provide your contact information, hopefully anyone who has any questions for Zhao 
we'll, we'll be able to send, uh, you know, anything to him directly. Um, now we're okay, gonna- Thank you very uh, much, Jeremy. Of course, thank you. Now we're gonna turn over the mic to William Wu of One Four City. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And uh, my name is William and uh, I'm currently located in Shanghai. Uh, but most of my time was based in London, uh, but just, just due to the pandemic, I just get my family back to Shanghai and uh, you know, spend a couple of months right here, just uh, also uh, get some business ongoing as well. So let me introduce from an industrial perspective, maybe. On the smart cities and circular economy. And I'm trying to share my screen And hopefully you can see my screen now. Not yet. There we go. There we go. Looks like Great. Yep. now we see okay. it. Okay. So um, um, I'm going to introduce One Four City as a one-stop uh, technological solution platform, uh, which presents lots of the smart city solutions. But that's partially, you know, to be based on my personal experiences in the past. So I will give you an overview about uh, where do I come from so that you know who is talking to you, actually. And then I will use a few smart city industrial cases that I personally have delivered um, and, and in the past uh, to give a flavor about my perspectives on smart cities, uh, especially. Okay. So um, very quickly uh, about me. So I was a uh, I was a graduate from Imperial College London. Um, in, in the UK and currently the managing director for One Four City. I'm also uh, on a, a part-time basis as the AI expert advisor uh, for the EIT, uh, you know, as part of the European uh, Commission uh, organization. And I've spent most of my time in my, in my life um, at Cisco. So uh, as a part of the original strategic innovation group in Cisco based in London, and uh, really looking at um, you know multi-million pounds um, innovation projects over there, and um, you know lots of them are smart city related, so not necessarily all at the scale of a city level, uh, you know uh, a town level, but actually lots of the innovation technology innovation projects we have got involved in are part of the smart cities. You know, talking about uh, EVs uh, and the energy trading between electrical vehicles and the national grid, for example talking about the uh, smart building management systems, uh, IoT sensor, uh, IoT sensor cyber securities, and also talking about the connecting autonomous vehicles. We do have our test beds in London, Olympia Park. So these are a, a part of the you know smart city branch, but we also have got a smart city project uh, running in the past and currently uh, got a, a few incentives afterwards. So I'll give you a bit of flavor on that as well. Um, and also, I, I'm, a, I'm an existing advisor for Imperial College Dyson School. Uh, you probably have heard about Dyson, uh, definitely. And, and also, you know, a couple of the other uh, small titles, uh, which could potentially expand uh, my remit to, to help the world and to help different regions to grow their understanding and also development for the smart cities, for example. So I was jump straight uh, to this case uh, before I introduce one for city or whatsoever. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Cityverve, and Cityverve is a Manchester-based uh, IoT city demonstrator initiative. So when I talk about its initiative, it was an ongoing, so it was initiated about five years ago, but it, it is still an ongoing effort. And that actually implies that, you know, any smart town development, any smart uh, city development, or even when Professor JL, you know, he mentioned about the eco parks uh, in China, which I have uh, 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 quite a hell of lovely experiences in, in, in engaging with lots of them actually, uh, understanding what their perspectives, understanding what, what do they need when they actually build up the eco parks. And these are all the ongoing and long-term uh, development uh, kind of exercise. It's never been a, a short-term exercise uh, for a smart city developments. So, so although the project itself has a timeline and it was initiated five years ago, but um, it is an ongoing uh, exercise for, for the region. But city, city Wolf as, as itself is a project. It's a project which uh, has attracted about 60 million pounds from the UK government um, and also jointly with the uh, 20 different partners uh, into a single project. Whereas in this project, Cisco is the industrial lead uh, for the project. 
It is built in a two kilometer square innovation corridor uh, in Manchester, so along the Oxford roads, and you do have got a variety of the um, of the setup uh, around the roads. So you do have got university campus, you have got about three or four hospitals, and also you definitely have businesses, you know, uh, resident residential areas, and also an industrial park, so called Manchester Science Park, uh, in this two kilometer region. The project was delivered by these 20 partners, and you can see that it's a combination of public sectors and private sectors. And so we have got city council, we have got uh, transport for Greater Manchester, we have got um, Central Manchester University Hospitals, uh, which is we call a CMFT, and we also have got some large organisations like Cisco and BT, and also Siemens uh, are, are leading the, uh, the 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 angles of the project, and inevitably. If you are looking at the smart city solutions, you know, having the right interface with the individuals, uh, with people on the ground, we're talking about the human centered design. You really need to feel, focus on the human needs. You talk about the persona design uh, to look at the requirement from in individuals in the society for the smart city requirements. So we do have got a bunch of SMAs working on this project as well, looking at different perspectives. So, for example, SatSafe is a vehicle device uh, sensing company looking at how they would be able to strengthen the driver behavior uh, in the local regions. A lot of the young drivers, they don't really, you know, um, they sometimes they are, because of their age, they probably, they probably don't drive very safely around their car or for their cars in the city. And that's an issue for, for Manchester. We also are looking at the uh, water infrastructure in the city uh, using the building management systems as an example. So an, an organization called Sparta Digital and they are looking at how they would be able to implement the water sensors uh, to detect the water temperature in the pipes of a, of a building management system, and and to be able to smartly remotely and control the uh, the water temperature uh, at the right threshold in between the right thresholds, that would ensure the drinking water to be safely delivered to the buildings, to the spaces, and to individuals. We also have got universities in the project as well, which I will skip, uh, but there, there are two universities. One is Manchester University, and the other is Manchester Metropolitan University. So apparently we have a AX program to deliver the project, which is quite important because if you don't have a skeleton, you would, you would always be stuck with a lot of the talking uh, rather than hand, um, get the hands onto the jobs. So what we did is, uh, I personally remember I, I stayed in the Manchester Hotel for for about two months because I, I i was based in london and uh, the reason why i was, was staying over there for about two months was because i continuously conducted uh, a number of the workshops with all the partners to flesh out what kind of use cases what kind of technologies that could be bundled together to deliver uh, to deliver the target for the smart uh, to the, for the smart city program and then we decided that we would have four pillars right here, as you can see on the screen. And initially we have got about 150 use cases, you know, starting from all the requirements from the city councils, from the local individuals, uh, from, from the local businesses to uh, the, uh, the narrow down, uh, the realizable, feasible solutions that can actually happen on the ground. And we sort of narrow that down in between, 20, uh, in between 15 to 20 use cases that we actually deliver on the ground. So I won't go into too much detail, just come some time. And uh, these are the four verticals that we have looked into. And you can see every single bullet point right here are uh, actually including the use cases that we actually had got involved, uh, combining the technologies and the user requirements on the ground. So apparently you have got, you need to, as I mentioned, you know, you have to got a, a program, a, a structure to be able to deliver a vast smart city program. On the right hand side, on the left hand side, you've got a design engage, uh, looking at how would you be able to design, how would you be able to engage different type of stakeholders to cope with their requirements. But on the right hand side, you have to intersect with the development and deployment, cyber securities, digital privacies, trust policies. These are the highlighted issues for every single use case that you want to really look into. But actually they are quite different when you talk about different use cases. You need to look at the common systems, the network and infrastructure, data management and analytics. Please bear in mind that, you know, when you talk about a smart city program, you're actually talking about the integration of different data, data silos, the current silo, silo data sets, databases, to put them together to not only integrate them, for example, in the transport sector, but also horizontally intersect between the transport and energy 
and environment uh, for the smart city use case development. So to be able to integrate these different type of data sets is a technological issue, but more, more importantly, it is a political and also a social science issue that you will need to set up the standards and the game rules for managing the data and for managing the analytics. In other words, how the question is, what would you be able to open? What about private data? What about the public data? How would you be able to intersect them together into, into the purpose for develop, delivering those use cases? So um, then we, we talk about development applications, we talk about interoperabilities and common data handling. And don't forget what is quite important is the bottom end is the implementation and evaluation. So we, we talk about how would you be able to evaluate the impact of those smart city use cases. You need to look at the baselines starting from day one to look at what's the current baselines for the use cases that you are tapping to. And then you want to really look at the benefits realization for your smart city use cases creation. All right, just comes of time, I'll skip a little bit over. Um, and also importantly is uh, your public awareness. So you want to raise the public awareness to really engage more public, more, more individuals like you and me, the citizens who actually live in the city, who care about the ongoings happening around them. So that you want to increase the influence of the, the sphere of the influence of what you're doing uh, in our smart city program. So that's what we do. We look at the interviews. We have conducted dozens of the interviews uh, to broadcast the perspectives from transport authorities, perspectives from the city authorities, perspectives from the technologists, and also the individuals uh, on the ground, and and can, and and integrate them into a a, a uh, and, and also broadcast them through different channels. Right. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a bit of flavor about you know a, a smart city program we have come across, and uh, we use that as a you know five years ago we use that as one of the flagship projects to continue our understanding of delivering the actual grounded and, and influential smart city programs um, uh, and afterwards. So that actually creates a uh, one for city. And this is what, what one for city is developed for. So we have got involved in lots of the innovative technological solutions. As mentioned, it doesn't need to be, always need to be on a smart city level because on a town level, on a city level, it's pretty high. It's, it's, it really in, involves lots of stakeholding management. But actually, if you look at the individual technological solutions, for example, flood management systems, uh, the risk management for flooding, for example, as mentioned, uh, the healthy agent in local regions, looking at the urban areas, semi-urban, rural areas, the, the social care management systems are quite different for different types of locations. And also looking at the investment incentives. Again, the rural area and, and the urban area in, and infrastructure investments will be slightly different in terms of the incentives. And that would also influence how would you be able to deliver the smart city related solutions as well. So um, that's why I would, I'm, I'm a person who is firmly believe that it's not just about smart cities, it is also about the key elements, different types of elements which are uh, consisted within a smart city program. Okay, so I'll skip these. So some of the uh, key competencies that One for City is about, this is more or less about the One for City uh, firm uh, philosophy. So we have got involved in uh, a award-winning um, exercise. You know, we developed uh, a smart city, smart town, actually, dated back to 2018. And we won the top five in 19, and we won the top one in 2020 as a smart city, as a smart town, a ranking, uh, uh, exercise in, in China. We also got involved in some China UK Newton Fund uh, to look at a smart farming exercise, a smart farming project, combining the strengths from the both the UK and Chinese um, based organizations to co-develop a smart farming solution together. Um, from one for city perspective, we try to um, use different products to facilitate the development of, of smart cities. So first one is this technology innovation search engine. We try to consolidate our understandings and also the innovation technological solutions onto a single database and then flash it out and then output it into a search engine so that once you use the search engine, you would be quickly to, you know, get into the category of the of the sectors you want to flip into. So for example, if you're interested in environmental uh, parts in smart cities, 
or if you are more or less into the uh, energy sector in uh, underneath the smart city program, you could use the search engine to look into the, the existing international solutions technologies uh, coming from our database to find a fit with what you are looking for. We also have a data exchange platform which has been used in both the UK and the Chinese smart cities uh, to deliver, again, to deliver the data management analytics, which I highlighted just now. It's a key question to look at, you know, different incentives for managing those different data sets coming from different sources. Uh, sometimes they are public data, sometimes they are pri private data, and you do have got different constraints for managing those different data from different sources, which is a key source for delivering any use cases underneath the smart city program. Um, so there will be key steps to develop any smart city solutions, uh, which has been highlighted right here. So master planning, design, data architecture, army collaboration, commercialization, and continuous evaluation, which is quite consistent with the logic, with the philosophy we have learned from the past smart city program, as I just, uh, just examples in the city world project. Here is some of the smart city projects uh, we have delivered. Uh, you know, one is uh, in China, uh, Zhou Shan Changzhi Island. As mentioned, this this is the uh, award-winning project uh, we have uh, proudly, you know, got involved into. We also helped the uh, the UK um, Birkinghamshire uh, to construct their city platform. Apparently, they've got about eleven different siloed, um, um, different different eleven different siloed. Uh, how do you call that? Different silo units. Uh, underneath a, a local authority uh, business as usual exercises uh, activities all the time and they want to look at what's the possibilities to build up a horizontal landscape data sets uh, and, and, and landscape information platform and we help them to create that. We also got involved in uh, Jiangxi uh, which is a, a province in China again to develop uh, and, and to plan and develop their smart town uh, um, over there as well. And I also mentioned about the uh, the farming project uh, as well. Okay, so I think I probably will just stop here, and I'm more than happy really to discuss more any of these things more into details, and happy to to reconvene uh, back to you, uh, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks, William. That was really that was really great, and and I think that your presentation really reflects uh, a very important. Um, the characteristic of smart cities in the sense that it, it's not all or nothing, right? Like it, it all it all boils down to the components. And at the end of the day, if you're trying to affect change and you're trying and you're recognizing that, you know, when you're dealing at the intersection of technology, academia, and government, things aren't changing overnight. And so you have to find a project or two projects to be able to run with and be able to prove adoption and be able to prove that there's opportunity here. And so what struck me just even on your last slide was, um, you know, the, 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 the specific examples, whether it was the potato disease, whether it was, a, you know, a specific product like potatoes or whether it's a specific industry like retail or catering that you had on the, on the Manchester side. I think pick your industry, pick your product try to develop something around it to show adoption and to tr and, and, and to show that there's uh, benefit and savings, et cetera. And then hopefully, you know, that creates an aura and an effect that continues to spread and, you know, gets more and more people to buy into the concept. So great, great job. That was really a, a great presentation. Okay, we're now gonna turn it over to Peter, uh, who's gonna provide our last presentation. Peter, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. So thank you very much for the introduction, Jeremy, and uh, very appreciated your all dedications and presentations from Wow and uh, William. So it's very uh, uh, it's very exciting um, the presentations that we can just probably maybe matching you know together and probably maybe can just discuss more after my speech and with the uh, uh, during the panel discussion. So let me uh, share with you about what we just do uh, now for the small city projects around the world. So currently we are working on the, the, the projects in seven different countries. And um, the one of the significant projects that we are actually working on 
with the master plan and also the uh, implementation level of the uh, establishment of smart city is in Vietnam and Ukraine and here in the United States and New York City, um, probably state, and also the some boroughs in London. Uh, we uh, we have been partnering up with the many different organizations, including the IT Department, International Trade of the UK government. And we have a mandates from the multiple central governments and municipalities, for example, Hanoi city government that we have uh, partners up. We have a mandates from them and to initiate the small city in Hanoi since last year. Uh, we are actually in the midst of, um, in the, midst of um, the providing the, uh, the implementation level of master plan by the end of this year. And we locally we have the signing uh, agreement, actually next Tuesday with the central government of Ukraine. So uh, throughout that, uh, we have some sort of this accomplishment to uh, making us kind of um, you know blueprints for the, um, the the communities and local citizens and the governments, uh, you know the bureaucrats and how to just engage themselves. Uh, with the uh, the next level of the small city, because we have, uh, we all know that we have suffered from the COVID COVID nineteen pandemic, so the definition and approachness of the small city will be a little bit different uh, from the past. So this is something that we're trying to work on right now. So I'd like to share the uh, slides. Just let me know if you see this. Yeah, we see that. Okay. All right, so we have three different entities. So World Smart Cities Forum is London-based uh, nonprofit organization. So every mandate agreement that we're dealing with, uh, the local governments and central governments based, based on the, the agreements with the World Smart Cities Forum. So, um, other two entities, Archive Labs, based in New York, and Accenture, based in both London and New York, uh, is they have different roles. And Accenture, for example, they uh, it has uh, nurtured many different uh, the tech startups and SMEs around the world. And, and specifically, uh, we went through the Level 39 ecosystem, which is Europe's largest open tech cluster in London. Uh, more than 400 startups. Uh, throughout the ecosystem, about more than uh, 13 companies become unicorns. So uh, we're trying to combine the small city initiatives with innovation ecosystem throughout the, um, the disruptive technologies around the world. Alkai Labs' uh, major goals and mission is to raise the funds to uh, support the uh, SPC, which is a special uh, purpose corporation, to um, you know, the security, uh, the, the financial resources, as well as the many different uh, the resources to support the, the projects for the, you know, the cities and uh, the, the central government. And uh, four major functions out of this Archive Labs or Smart Cities Forum Consortium is we deliver the master plan. There are two different types of master plan. The first one is basic concept design and um, the second one is implementation level. And also the, the part of the SPC to um, the giving the specific goals and um, the missions to every stakeholders of the SPC. Small city tech sandbox is the one of the distinctive, um, the characteristic of what we are trying to do. Uh, basically about 30% of the uh, budget will go directly to the startups which they actually go through the, the core programs. So uh, 12 months is actually default, the time period of, time period of the core programs to uh, validate their solutions and technology and services. And we also do technology transfer uh, and also commercial legations and also the small space, the global scale fund. And uh, we also the helping the, uh, the city government and municipalities to raise the uh, scale of fund to, uh, to give away some specific money to the uh, stakeholders inside of the uh, projects as well. 
And philosophy is a very simple thing because um, a lot of uh, countries in Asia and even Africa and the Middle East, they actually focusing on how to build the, um, the new development type of the projects in their own countries or cities. But most important thing is uh, just like the fingerprints of the human being, they, you know, cities can be, cannot be the same because uh, every city has their own culture, history, and economic level. So we're trying to embrace the more people coming in to experience uh, what the small city is really about. Um, so we, our philosophy is based on the you know people or uh, the human or citizens put uh, as one uh, the upfront lines. So people centricity or a human centric city kind of design is something that we are pursuing right now. So. Uh, four other angles to support this kind of concept. Of course, we need to have uh, the specific data, so the, which is public data or even private data. data. So data-driven economy uh, is one of the things that we have to ac accomplish uh, throughout the, uh, the projects or initiatives. Technologies and innovation is also the key because the every city needs to be uh, much more, um, you know, the sustainable econ uh, economically. So uh, trying to make the city much more eco economic, sustainable in a way of uh, the innovation and also the, the new technologies. And environmental friendly ecosystem is also very important. So that's why we, everybody's talking about ESG these days. Uh, it's not really, um, you know, uh, easy to say this environmental friendly ecosystem, but this is something that the human being or human race needs to uh, pursue that throughout the uh, uh, small city initiatives everywhere. Uh, connecting the global cities, because the one small city cannot be the big market. So to collaborate the, among the cities and doing this kind of initiatives eventually will produce the, the very better and strong uh, environment and also the market itself. So this is something that uh, very important to support the concept of people centricity. Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples that we are actually working on right now. So one is Vietnam and another one is uh, uh, Ukraine. So both countries are developing countries stage, uh, but it's also they are located very, very important uh, reasons. Uh, also, they are very much potential. Uh, that's why we are actually really interested in engaging uh, this initiative. So since uh, back in 2016. So vision for, uh, for example, vision for uh, Ukrainian smart city is smart city and innovation hub in Eastern Europe. So um, we have a lot of potentials in the Eastern Europe area, even also the, um, the Middle East area. So uh, we trying to balance the uh, economic power or the level of the, the, um, the citizenship and um, also innovation in Europe to much more focusing on the Eastern Europe area. Core value is uh, pursuit of happiness and sustainable sharing economy and job creation and clean uh, eco-friendly city innovation, future city technologies. Uh, those are four are the values that the city of any cities in Ukraine. We're actually focusing on Lviv and Kiev, but these two cities could be maybe achieving this kind of goals within the next five years. Uh, location in Vietnam, we targeted on uh, the major district of uh, Hanoi, which is the capital city of Vietnam. Uh, back in 2018, Donald Trump of the United States and also the leader of Kim Jong-un of North Korea, they actually had a summit talk so this area is very meaningful because it's old city, but uh, it's diversity existing there because uh, you can see that Western uh, type of culture mixed with local conventional culture combined. So most of the, um, the people like traveling to Vietnam, they visit this area. So even though the population is only 400,000 people living in there, but more than 2 million people annually, they visit this area, this district to uh, fill the real uh, culture of Vietnam. So we are focusing on here as the urban regeneration and also digital transformation. Um, the main themes in Hanoi Smart City, for example, even it applies to uh, Ukrainian cities as well, 
and smart mobility, smart water, digital smart city, energy efficiency, safe and living. Those are four different concepts. Then under these pillars, we actually uh, define subcategories, which will become the, uh, the specific uh, projects in the end. Um, also, we can talk about the themes and we can talk about the technologies. As I said, technology is not the, uh, the major goals of the smart city. It's actually the, you know, the people and citizens and governance, they can take advantage of the uh, technologies and solution because just like a human being and this technologies and solutions also, you know, eventually evolve. So uh, based on the evolution, we uh, probably just uh, the build up the better ecosystem that any kind of disruptive technology solution can be applied to the city. So, um, you know, recently we are working on, you know, building the better IoT systems in the city and AI, cloud, blockchain, big data, and also other network can be, uh, you know, embedded in the city in terms of uh, we, when, when it comes to technologies we talk about. Uh, there are many different types of services technology can be embedded in the city, but it depends on how we define the, uh, the projects, which is new development. We can call it as maybe, uh, you know, green uh, field projects, urban regeneration, or, you know, brownfield uh, projects. It depends on defining the city or district and we can, uh, probably bring the, uh, some of the, the distinctive uh, technologies uh, as one of the uh, top priorities in that area. There are five um, common grounds uh, for these two uh, initiatives and projects in Vietnam and Ukraine. So we are built, we're trying to build up the innovative tech smart city or smart tech city uh, with bringing up with smart city tech sandbox and open data, open science, digital twin kind of concept, as also the open factory. So uh, these three things are the kind of um, engines to support the uh, economic uh, ecosystem and the platform, because a city can be, city should be, uh, you know, independent in terms of the, the creating of jobs or uh, boosting of the, uh, the, in, the industry as the kind of the future engine for the city. And open big data city, which is also data market, is very important because people are not really aware of what the data is really um, meaningful to the, the citizens or the people uh, living in the city. I think that the, um, the sharing the data and also the taking advantage of the data from private sectors as well as public sectors are very important. So uh, trying to uh, create the kind of the hub or the models or platform to how the data can be shared and also can be um, uh, the real businesses for the SMEs or the tech startups. And the living lab hub or network, we just call it as connecting the global cities. As I said, um, the small city initiatives around the world, uh, I don't believe that there's like big, such a big success model at the moment. Every city, uh, small city project is ongoing uh, process. But in the end, the, these cities should be sharing their experiences and also their, um, you know, the successful cases or even failure cases. So trying to bring the, the cities to find out the mutual interest or the common ground together, then we can actually create the, the better markets or, um, you know, the innovation friendly markets. Then this is uh, something that we have to pursue as well. Civic experience innovation technologies. I also think that almost more than 70% of the concept of the smart city cannot be seen, which is invisible. And only 20, 30% will be visible, but uh, it should be uh, spread out and also shared by the citizens of stakeholders of smart cities. And the people uh, should experience what they're trying to use. Even we're just talking about uh, sharing car systems or electric car systems, and even the uh, protecting um, themselves from coronavirus, for example. And so, and how to just share the data and also the how to uh, drink the, the 
you know, uh, the clean water, for example, throughout the, uh, the, the water purification systems or energy and uh, also the mobility and transportation systems and even security and any kind of the, the technology solutions of life and culture. I think that this is also uh, important uh, that people easily understand what kind of values they can get from their experience or the, the usage of those kind of concepts, I mean, the solutions from the, the, the small city projects. And as I said, 20-30% uh, of uh, you know, small city can be visible. And I see that uh, these are the, something that the people can easily understand. This is a small city as an infrastructure. So uh, some of the, the developing countries, as well as developed countries, they have to move on, they have to move forward to shift their uh, conventional economy to the next level or you know, small jump or quantum jump uh, throughout the uh, new experience. I think that a lot of uh, cases, even in the United States, uh, you can see that also the, a lot of uh, efforts by Tesla uh, or Amazon, um, even we just like sharing this uh, you know, materials and um, the discussions throughout the, the StreamYard and Zoom. And so this is actually a new experience and based on the infrastructure. So um, this is actually totally depends on the uh, definitions of the local governments and also local uh, the communities. We can actually define the, the infrastructures for each one of them. Uh, small city tech sandbox uh, is, is very important as well. Um, as I said, uh, about 30% of the budget should go directly to the startups, which is actually very highly successful or uh, proven themselves in a way of uh, providing their solutions and services into the public. So we just going through um, the, the specific you know, time period to prove their solutions and technologies to the public and trying to help them out to solve their problems, foster them and eventually validate everything and uh, about 25%, 30% out of them, they actually are, they deserve to win the beat uh, for the small city project as well. So this is a basic uh, di diagram and how they, the, the, you know, the candidates of startups, they actually go through. Uh, it takes about one, two years. Uh, they jumping into um, the small city tech sandbox and every different projects. And they just, in you know, uh, uh, de develop their uh, you know services and solutions in some some certain level, and they can be picked by the the city government or uh, SPC, and eventually they you know secure the projects, and they dedicate themselves into the the smart city initiatives, and in the end they can actually uh, raise more fund from the uh, syndicate fund of the smart city to, you know uh, the the entities and. Also, they can relocate themselves into the other uh, small city projects. They can expand themselves to the global market. And this is official small city tech sandbox platform. We're just going through Accenture.co. Um, we're just dealing with the, the, some of the projects here in New York City throughout the, the prop tech hub and uh, also Ukrainian small cities and Vietnamese small cities. This is the flow chart of the small city tech sandbox and investment. And um, also SPC and uh, investment flow can be uh, based on PPP level. So the, we anticipate about 20, 25% from the government end and the rest of them from the, the public uh, private sectors to uh, achieve the uh, very strong goals and from both sides. And uh, also we anticipate new special law on small cities and deregulation uh, you know, uh, scheme will be also uh, uh, applied to this kind of initiatives as well. Uh, I think I have to stop here. So I can, I, I'm glad, I'll be glad to share my insights more uh, during the our panel discussions. Thank you very much. And back to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Peter. That was fascinating. Really, uh, each each of your presentations was was superb and uh, enlightening, and there's a lot for us to to all learn. And unfortunately, I mean, they were so great, uh, and there was so much detail. But unfortunately, we're we're nearing the end of our session, and we only have a few minutes left. I'll, I'll just ask maybe one or two quick questions for your quick 
reflection. Um, one that, that comes to mind uh, is the, the more that I learn about smart cities and the more that I learn about circular economy and, 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 and what's going on, you know, on one hand, it's beyond impressive, it's beyond um, encouraging and empowering, and obviously it's dramatically helped so many cities. On the other hand, I'm, I'm curious as to how you each um, think about conflicts that arise within the context of a, a smart city. You, you could have conflicts vis-a-vis -vis the government. You might have, for example, the municipal government, the local government is very, uh, very much behind the smart city concept, wants to put dollars behind it, wants to create these partnerships, but there might be competing interests at the state and, and federal level. You know, when I think about this past year and you look at cities like New York, for example, that was the city of New York was at odds with the state of New York that was at odds with the United States federal government. I know that's just one example, but I know that there are many other circumstances where the interests of the city might not necessarily be in sync with the interests of, you know, the broader community. And so that, that's one type of conflict. You could have uh, conflict vis-a-vis -vis big business. You know, I saw various statistics that 75, 80% of the income coming into municipalities oftentimes come, oftentimes come through big oil and um, raw materials and end products that create waste. Etc., and that obviously is counter to the concept of circularity and what smart city is trying to do. So, on one hand, you don't want to upset your base uh, in terms of the income that's coming in. On the other hand, of course, you want to promote sustainability. And then the last one that I saw was just as an example: the indigent, the indigent community. You know, the the the, the poor, um, uh, the poor in any given city. They you already have with them an informal circular economy, they're buying used goods, they're going into thrift shops, etc. And, you know, I saw, you know, various points that for cities that move forward in, in the world of, of, of smart technology and circularity, so is that going to increase the product, the, the cost of, of circular products? Um, you know, you, you might have in certain cities, you might have um, demolished buildings that from a sustainability perspective, you might want to repurpose into a new set of apartment buildings or something like that. But on the other hand, you have poor people that are living in slums and maybe you want to open up um, you know, these buildings to them. And, and again, New York City just is an example of what happened at the beginning of COVID. So it's just, it's a, it's a broader question as to how you deal with um, conflict and, and sort of in your vision of smart city, how do you do that? Again, we, we only have three, four minutes so maybe I'll just ask each of you to just, uh, you know, quick thought, um, you know, that, that sort of jumps to your mind. Why don't we, uh, Joao, why don't we come to you first? You're on mute. You're still on mute, jo Joao. Thank you. Sorry. There Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to participate uh, with this summit again and to share uh, our uh, knowledge and opinion about this important issue uh, concerning to smart cities and sustainable cities also um, in my opinion uh, there are some of course uh, convergence between these two dimensions the smart cities and sustainable cities we can we can deal with these different uh, fields of research and different areas in terms of uh, public and private uh, actions okay uh, but i think that uh, a lot of uh, elements of smart cities a lot of uh, uh, electronic devices and uh, a lot of technologies concerning to smart cities conception would be improve the sustainable sustainable uh, cities, sustainable uh, system uh, that we can uh, apply to improve the quality of life of the population, uh, mainly in big cities like Sao Paulo, uh, uh, New York, London, or in big cities in China, in Asia, around the world in general. But uh, I think uh, there are uh, four uh, main actions that we can improve 
in terms of uh, uh, to reach the circular economy and sustainable cities uh, mainly. Uh, the first one is recycling. Recycling uh, actions uh, mainly when we refer to the manufacturing system. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, very important initiatives of companies. The Natura that I mentioned before, uh, that there is a plant in the north of Brazil, is a, one of uh, very important case, but there are a lot of examples in clothing and food companies here in Brazil. Uh, the, the second action is the reuse, reuse materials, reuse energy, reuse water, uh, and also this is an important approach in, in terms of uh, manufacturing production system, in terms of uh, closed loop production system. Uh, the third one is reduce a lot of actions to reduce the consumption of water, energy, and raw material also. And the last one is remanufacturing. Remanufacturing, uh, I think it's the most uh, uh, important and most complex action in terms of uh, a circular economy and closed loop production systems. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, automakers around the world are developing some new projects in order to reach this kind of level of uh, circular economy. Mm -hmm. the remanufacturing system. Also, a lot of uh, uh, electronic companies that produce a lot of electronic devices, computers, iPhones, and so on, uh, are developing some projects in the next future to promote the remanufacturing system also. So, uh, wow, I this just, is some points, okay? This is amazing, yeah, perfect. Um, William, how about you? Any, any, any kind of, and I, and I think we'll make these last thoughts just because I think the, Technology is going to cut us off in the next uh, two, three minutes. So, uh, right, William? Okay. Okay. I'll try my best. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, great insights. Um, so, very quickly for me, um, the challenges for smart cities, the first step is really to define the boundaries. When I talk about boundaries, it could be physical boundaries. Um, so, we're talking about whether it's on the city level or it's actually a town level or it actually it's an eco park level or it's a street level, for example. We have come across the projects for all these four levels, actually, uh, from my personal experience. And that's quite important because the involved stakeholders for those different levels of smart city development will be quite different. And that means the interest coming from those different stakeholders will be different. So that's actually a challenge number one, is how would you like to define the boundaries of your smart city program uh, as, a, as, a, 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 as a starting point? The second play is uh, what we have experienced in the past, again, is the conflict of interest from different stakeholders again. For example, when we look at the uh, innovation projects, smart, uh, smart medium enterprises, they do have the interest to really quickly demonstrate what they are capable of, and then they hope that they will be able to use the smart city program to engage with the key local authorities to commercialize their solutions. And that's what they do, because they don't have much resources to, to spend too much time on it. So we need to understand where do they come from, from the local authorities, they are more caring about their citizens. They care about the eco economic uh, and environment and social values within happening in their regions. And you need to really be careful about that because you talk about the cyber security, uh, sorry, digital privacy, uh, etc. These kind of the uh, ethical, uh, high-level, uh, you know, requirements as well. And the last layer is the is the how, how would you be able to integrate technologies? with those requirements. So as mentioned, we do have got the dynamics between the public and private uh, data sharing. And we all know that, you know, smart city is the great opportunity for you to reconsolidate the fragmented uh, values or activities happening in your region, and, and as well as the data. So technologies will be able to help with that. But um, again, how do you design the technologies to help with that is a key challenge right here. Sure. So I just want to focus sure. on three challenges. Thank you. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, Peter, well, last word with you. It just like, you know, I, we don't have much time, but I totally agree with William and also our, uh, their perspectives. And one more thing about the biggest challenge and obstacles for the, you know, you know building up the better small cities and circular economy is basically uh, the politics and diplomacies and also so um, that's why that will be some sort of the um, the collaboration between the, the 
the public sectors and private sectors working together. So that is something that you know, should be secured. Hundred uh, percent makes sense. Well, I, I certainly look forward to uh, a follow-up session because there's a lot more to talk about. There were a lot more questions that I had. I know there was a lot more that you wanted to say, you each wanted to say, and I'm sure that there were plenty of questions from the audience, but we're going to have to cut, uh, cut it short here. Thank all of you very, very much for all of your efforts, for your hard work in preparing and taking the time this afternoon to present. So from what I understand from Peter and others, there are over 100,000 uh, people who have been paying attention and tuning in over the last couple of days to this amazing Open Business Council Summit. I wanna thank Joao, William, Peter for your wonderful insights. Again, for all of your efforts, it's been a pleasure spending the last hour with uh, you all and look forward to our next opportunity together. In the meantime, stay safe, be well, and uh, uh, hope we get to see each other in person soon. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joe. Bye, Thank you, William. Thank you very much. Thank you.